Encrypted. The classic horror podcast. Tales of supernatural horror and suspense. So these seven children, Anne and Matilda, James, William and Henry, Harriet and Dorothea, came to live with their grandmother. The house in which their grandmother had lived since her childhood was built in the time of the Georges. It was not a pretty house, but roomy, substantial and square, and a great cedar tree outstretched its branches almost to the windows. When the children were come out of the cab, five sitting inside and two beside the driver, they were shown into their grandmother's presence. They stood in a little black group before the old lady, sitting in her bow window, and she asked them each their names, and repeated each name in her kind, quavering voice. Then to one she gave a workbox, to William a jackknife, to Dorothea a painted ball, to each a present according to age, and she kissed all her grandchildren to the youngest. My dears, she said, I wish to see all of you bright and gay in my house. I am an old woman, so that I cannot romp with you, but Anne must look to you, and Mrs. Fenn too, and every morning and every evening you must all come in to see your granny and bring me smiling faces that call back to my mind my own son, Harry. But all the rest of the day, when school is done, you shall do just as you please, my dears. And there is only one thing, just one, I would have you remember, in the large spare bedroom that looks out on the slate roof, there stands in the corner an old oak chest. Aye, older than I, my dears, a great deal older, older than my grandmother. Play anywhere else in the house, but not there. She spoke kindly to them all, smiling at them, but she was very old, and her eyes seemed to see nothing of this world. And the seven children, though at first they were gloomy and strange, soon began to be happy and at home in the great house. There was much to interest and to amuse them there. All was new to them. Twice every day, morning and evening, they came in to see their grandmother, who every day seemed more feeble, and she spoke pleasantly to them of her mother and her childhood, but never forgetting to visit her store of sugar plums. And so the weeks passed by, it was evening twilight when Henry went upstairs from the nursery by himself to look at the oak chest. He pressed his fingers into the carved fruit and flowers and spoke to the dark, smiling heads at the corners, and then, with a glance over his shoulder, he opened the lid and looked in. But the chest concealed no treasure, neither gold nor baubles, nor was there anything to alarm the eye. The chest was empty, except that it was lined with silk of old rose, seeming darker in the dusk, and smelling sweet of potpourri. And while Henry was looking in, he heard the softened laughter and the clinking of the cups downstairs in the nursery. And out at the window, he saw the day darkening. These things brought strangely to his memory his mother, who in her glimmering white dress used to read to him in the dusk. And he climbed into the chest, and the lid closed gently down over him. When the other six children were tired with their playing, they filed into their grandmother's room for her good night and her sugar plums. 
She looked out between the candles at them as if she were uncertain of something in her thoughts. The next day Anne told her grandmother that Henry was not anywhere to be found. Deary me, child, then he must be gone away for a time, said the old lady. She paused. But remember, all of you, do not meddle with the oak chest. But Matilda could not forget her brother Henry, finding no pleasure in playing without him. So she would loiter in the house, thinking where he might be. And she carried her wooden doll in her bare arms, singing under her breath all she could make up about it. And when one bright morning she peeped in on the chest, so sweet-scented and secret, it seemed that she took her doll with her into it, just as Henry himself had done. So Anne and James and William, Harriet and Dorothea were left at home to play together. Some day maybe they will come back to you, my dears, said their grandmother, or maybe you will go to them. Heed my warning as best you may. Now Harriet and William were friends together, pretending to be sweethearts, while James and Dorothea liked wild games of hunting and fishing and battles. On a silent afternoon in October, Harriet and William were talking softly together, looking out over the slate roof at the green fields, and they heard the squeak and frisking of a mouse behind them in the room. They went together and searched for the small dark hole from whence it had come out, but finding no hole, they began to finger the carving of the chest, and to give names to the dark, smiling heads, just as Henry had done. I know. Let's pretend you are Sleeping Beauty, Harriet, said William, and I'll be the prince that squeezes through the thorns and comes in. Harriet looked gently and strangely at her brother, but she got into the box and lay down, pretending to be fast asleep. And on tiptoe, William leaned over, and seeing how big was the chest, he stepped in to kiss the Sleeping Beauty and to wake her from her quiet sleep. Slowly, the carved lid turned on its noiseless hinges, and only the clatter of James and Dorothea came in sometimes to recall Anne from her book. But their old grandmother was very feeble, and her sight dim, and her hearing extremely difficult. Snow was falling through the still air upon the roof, and Dorothea was a fish in the oak chest and James stood over the hole in the ice, brandishing a walking stick for a harpoon, pretending to be an Eskimo. Dorothea's face was red, and her wild eyes sparkled through her tousled hair, and James had a crooked scratch upon his cheek. You must struggle, Dorothea, and then I shall swim back and drag you out. Be quick now, he shouted with laughter as he was drawn into the open chest. And the lid closed softly and gently down as before. Anne, left to herself, was too old to care overmuch for sugar plums, but she would go solitary to bid her grandmother good night, and the old lady looked wistfully at her over her spectacles. Well, my dear, she said with trembling head, and she squeezed Anne's fingers between her own knuckled finger and thumb. What lonely old people we two are, to be sure. Anne kissed her grandmother's soft, loose cheek. She left the old lady sitting in her easy chair, her hands upon her knees, and her head turned sidelong towards her. When Anne was gone to bed, she used to sit reading her book by candlelight. She drew up her knees under the sheets, resting her book upon them. Her story was about fairies and gnomes, 
and the gently flowing moonlight of the narrative seemed to illumine the white pages, and she could hear in fancy fairy voices. So silent was the great many-roomed house, and so mellifluent were the words of the story. Presently, she put out her candle, and with a confused babble of voices close to her ear, and faint, swift pictures before her eyes, she fell asleep. And in the dead of night, she rose out of her bed in dream, and with eyes wide open, yet seeing nothing of reality, moved silently through the vacant house, past the room where her grandmother was snoring in brief, heavy slumber. She stepped lightly and surely, and down the wide staircase, and Vega the far shining stood over her against the window above the slate roof. Anne walked into the strange room beneath, as if she were being guided by the hand towards the oak chest. There, just as if she were dreaming it was her bed, she laid herself down in the old rose silk, in the fragrant place. But it was so dark in the room that the movement of the lid was indistinguishable. Through the long day, the grandmother sat in her bow window. Her lips were pursed, and she looked with dim, inquisitive scrutiny upon the street where people passed to and fro, and vehicles rolled by. At evening, she climbed the stair and stood in the doorway of the large, spare bedroom. The ascent had shortened her breath. Her magnifying spectacles rested upon her nose. Leaning her hand on the doorpost, she peered in towards the glimmering square of window in the quiet gloom. But she could not see far, because her sight was dim and the light of day feeble, nor could she detect the faint fragrance as of autumnal leaves. But in her mind, was a tangled skein of memories, laughter and tears, and children long ago become old-fashioned, and the advent of friends, and last farewells, and gossiping fitfully, inarticulately, with herself. The old lady went down again to her window seat, Today's story was The Riddle by Walter de la Mer. It was read by Jasper Lestrange.